Hi everyone, welcome to the first devlog of 2023. I'm here with Thomas and today we'll be going over the progress we've made regarding our resource management and automation game Forge Industry. And the main topic probably will be what Thomas has worked on a lot as well, which is the um, dynamic markets and whole buying and selling simulation. Of course, we have some other cool stuff that we want to talk about as usual, so stick around for those things as well. So let's jump straight into it. Over the past month and a bit, um, we've had the very fun task that we may have been slightly procrastinating for a few months before of implementing supply and demand in our game. Because, you know, of course, we want to really have a lot of immersion, not have a single meta item. We want every playthrough to be different. And as part of that, we need to have some way of more advanced markets, not just we sell something and it will always give us 50 gold, which is our current implementation with Marketplace, which you saw all the previous devlogs. Now we want through the harbor to really open up trading and give you the option to sell a lot of things, but know that the market will get destabilized from that. Of course, I didn't implement it. Thomas here did. So Thomas, I think you can explain a bit more about um, the pain and the struggles that went into it. Maybe can you start first by how do you start on implementing something like supply and demand? Yeah, the first thing you need is basically a rough overview of what you want to do math-wise. Because when you're playing with numbers, it's very easy to just get a very weird result. Uh, we want something that is within bounds. We don't want prices to go negative like a couple of years ago with oil. So how we started this is instead of immediately diving into code, we started with a pretty advanced Excel sheet, I think. You spent quite some time on it. Um, and what was the main goal? What did we simulate in that one? So basically how we tackled this is we first took our factions. We have several factions in the game, like dwarves, elves, things like that. And we gave them a population based on their, well, the size of their land. On top of that, we then take into account what their needs are, like how much do they actually need of a certain item. We take into account the rarity, uh, and how trivial or necessary an item is. Uh, like for example, water, if there is no water, everyone would want water because you want to survive most of the time. On top of that, factions create their own resources as well in the background. Like if you have a dwarf, you're not the only source where they can get, for example, iron ingots. Even if they would buy it from you, they also have their own supply and that supply for example, if they have a world event and they find a gold mine or an iron mine or whatever, this can also influence your market. So now we have all those values. And for example, I sell a hundred of iron ore to the dwarves. What happens then? Well, they use that. So that it get added to their storage, so to say. And over time, they will basically use it and create the need to have more again if they can't produce it themselves. On top of that, if you're, for example, good allies with the dwarves, of course, you know, friendly business, always a better price. On the other hand, if you're not on good terms with the elves, well, they might screw you over financially if you want to buy from them. So do take into account that you do want to make sure you're allies with everyone or at least the, per the people you want to buy from. Yeah, because if you're at complete war, you simply won't be able to access that market anymore at a certain point. On top of that, uh, some very rare items may become available depending on what level uh, you are in your alliance with, for example, the dwarves. They might have a very rare material that they only give to their best allies. Who knows? Besties. So how you visualize that in the game, of course, is much easier than to explain it in an Excel sheet. Basically, all of this UI is done through the harbor. Yep. Yeah. And what that means is you have your shipping manifest, so you once you've created your items, you send them off to the harbor. Once you've restored it, you select that, hey, I want to ship these items. And then in the next step of the UI, you basically select, I want to go to this faction. I want to go to the dwarves. I want to go to the Goliaths or whoever. And then you're also presented with what do they offer? Because of course, it's not just a one direction supply and demand story. They also have their own specialties. For example, dwarves may sell some rare minerals that you can't get anywhere else. And they have limited supplies of that. So you can't just buy out their entire stock or you can, but then that will influence how will the prices evolve over the next days or weeks? Because yeah, supply has gone up, 
uh, demand has gone on, but supply has gone down, which influences the market. You can very easily visualize this in our UI. We have the, the graphs to see what is the expected stock and are we expecting the price to go up or down? So that way you as the player can also maybe decide that, ooh, maybe I should just wait a few more days and hope that the price goes down. Of course, this provides another challenge because if you want to sell something, you also have to keep in account, okay, are my prices is maybe another faction also creating the same item as I am and are they saturating the market? Do I have to be before them to sell everything or should I just wait and keep my stock in some storage crate somewhere? until the market has stabilized. We believe that this really adds a fully new level of depth to our game basically, because suddenly it's not just make items and send them off into a black box and you get gold. No, now the selling part is also something that requires your attention. Yeah, and the entire system is basically one giant Triforce, the harbor, the factions and the dynamic markets. They all work together seamlessly because like Marnik said, if you buy something from the dwarves, your own prices may, may suffer from it or actually increase. And that brings us around to the second big thing that especially Thomas also worked on. So supply and demand was already quite complex and it wasn't something that Thomas worked on alone. I think you used input of both me and William as well because just getting the initial logic was quite tough. Something maybe easier, I don't know, I didn't program it, um, is item stats and not just item stats, also building stats and stuff like that. So maybe if you can give us a very quick overview of what did you really achieve there? Yeah, so we'll add some uh, kind of item tracking that we use for our achievements and our milestones. Uh, but on top of that, we wanted to see stats in buildings, like for example, how many items do you create per tick? Or how long would it take you to create an item? Or how much gold are we generating or value are we creating every tick things like that on top of that this is a personal story um, there was one very interesting stat i don't think you know this marnix oh. uh, but did you know that 69 percent of our viewers aren't subscribed that is a pretty cool stat yeah so uh i, I wish to change that how about we make that 69 percent subscribe you guys know what to do should be down there go and subscribe if this is something that you like. What our goal with the stats is, it's not done yet. We want to implement also, you know, a global status page where you can see your game stats. So now you have building stats. If you want to see, for example, where is there a bottleneck? For example, you can very easily see that, oh, this building is actually losing me money in creating something. Maybe that's acceptable. Maybe it's because it's making a part for something that down the line will be much more valuable. Or maybe it's just simply not worth it. Um, and this is something that you can very easily see as well, that, hey, maybe I should rethink what is this building's purpose and is it placed optimally? Because it also keeps into account things like how long does my worker need to transport items back and forth? So you can see, are there problems with my routes and things like that. In general, it's a very good tool to further optimize everything that you're doing in your world. And those are the two main topics, um, of course, We've done other stuff. William has done other stuff. The rest of the team has done other stuff. So let's go and do it in our signature lightning round style. Lightning round. First thing I did was I added a bunch of extra decors. I was just in a 3D modeling phase at some point and I was like, you know, we need fences, we need walls. It can always be fun to just spruce up your world. Speaking of spruces, there's also now decorative trees you can place for those who like trees i guess i don't know some other things we've been working on is more settings some of them ux wise some of them accessibility wise um, we'll get back to accessibility at a later point as well in this video so stick around for that and then some examples of that one is maybe for example if you place a building do you automatically want the window to open or not these are things that we've encountered through playtesting that, hey, some people really just want to be very optimal. They're like, I place this building, I immediately want to create a route. Some are like, I want to create multiple buildings first and then later on deal with the routes. We've now made a bunch of similar settings to that or other settings really. And then also one big one is, as we're now approaching the later stages of game development, as you may have felt by no more big major features almost being added, is we're <laughs> squashing a lot of bugs as well. So that's something that William has been really busy with as well. Um, for the past month, we had a lot of bugs. We had basically pot finding was broken again. Um, for example, it didn't take into account things like our fences and everything. So you just had walkers walk right through it. And yeah, there's too many bugs to name. I think we've 
30, 40 issues almost over the past month and a bit. Another thing we did is we improved our accessibility. You can now choose your own font, which is something I think we are very unique in. This is very useful for people with, for example, dyslexia or things like that, that can make it easier to play the game. On top of that, we also added some other UX uh, improvements. For example, you can now rename buildings. And when you create routes, you don't reset your item if you change buildings and your inputs are based on what recipe you have selected. So it's a bit easier to find what you're looking for. So what's next? We've talked about what we've done before. Of course, as I said, we're reaching the later stages of development, but we're still nowhere near done. Um, I think the main thing now, we have one big issue basically left um, that is a core mechanic and that is material research. So now we already had building research, for example, and the material research, the point there is to find new alloys, for example, because now you can make steel ingots from the beginning in our game. However, we would want a research system where you have those more advanced metals. You need to throw a bunch of materials at it and then research it and hope you to find a way to actually make it. Uh, another thing we want to research if that is feasible and how the user experience is, is control support. Uh, there are a lot of users that prefer controllers. For example, me, I like control for a lot of games, but this is not the best kind of game to play with it, but we want to at least give it a thought and see how good we can make it feel. This can also be a big improvement for people on the Steam Deck, because, well, we all have one and we like it, so if we, we want that. <laughs> if we didn't have a Steam Deck, I can't guarantee that controller support would have been added, but yeah, when we play the game on Steam Deck, it's like, ah, oh, this is not the greatest. Yeah, indeed. So. We're adding controller support, but no console support, so you know. Yet. Another thing, of course, as I said before, squashing more and more bugs, they keep popping up. And now we're finally reaching the point where, okay, we're finalizing our mechanics. We can focus on, okay, actually dealing with the bugs because before, if we change something, like fix a bug, then we would suddenly rewrite the, the, the system that originally caused it and we would have double work, basically. Now we're reaching a point where we can, A, start implementing um, or working more on fixing bugs, as well as implementing more items. One big thing as well is because our item system has been notoriously refactored quite a lot, is we never really had the urge to add a lot of items. Because of that, some of our stations still aren't implemented yet, such as our Fletcher station, because there's no point in implementing 500 items if then the week later Jamie decides to nuke everything because he has a new implementation. And then we have to remake it again. However, we're finalizing those systems now as well, so we can finally add all of the items really that we want in the game. And that about wraps up our latest month in development. I hope this is insightful to you. You can follow along the development a bit more, get some more insight into what we've been doing. If that's something that you like, we already said before, but be sure to leave a like and also subscribe to our channel. It's when win for both of us as we make this content every week where we either talk about our own game or we talk about some game development concepts in general. The game is also available for wishlisting on Steam right now, so go ahead and do that if you haven't done it yet, so you'll get notified when we release. If you're subscribed, you'll also get some notifications through this channel, I'm pretty sure, but better safe than sorry. Apart from that, that's all we've had to say, I think. So um, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Bye.